been able to do and achieve. Even in the confinement, we have done so many things and there are others that we, have, we may not have done. Looking very quickly, today I've just chosen the first reading for our meditation, but looking at these uh, readings, they are all indicating a new beginning. The first reading with the blessings that are there, a new beginning. With what God is doing with the psalmist here and presenting it, it's about graciousness, about the favor of God, about God who sheds his light upon those who dwell in the valley of darkness, and he makes them glad and shout with joy. We get an extract from the letter to the Galatians, and it is the only place in all the letters that Paul wrote that he mentions the woman who gave birth to Jesus. Only once in the whole Bible does Paul mention that woman, though she does, he does not call that woman Mary, but he says, when the time had fully come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman. Whatever this woman was for Paul, he did not care because he comes from a very patriarchal society. But whether he mentions it's Mary or Judith or Esther or Beatrice, we know that this woman is talking about is Mary. And born of the law becomes one through whom we inherit. The gospel is quickly talking about the shepherds. They are returning. They have heard the angels. They are coming to talk blessings about this child. So it is, the readings are all about blessings and they are about the story of a new beginning. Now when we come to think about this new beginning, I want to talk to you a little bit about the month of January and how it comes that from a certain time in history it becomes the first month of the year. It was not always the first month. The first month until 153 BC was March. It is in 153 BC that this month, January, comes from the Latin Janus, the door, meaning the opening of a calendar or a season, or Janitor, uh, the one who bears the keys of heaven's all uh, beginnings, is put at the beginning of seasons. Now, January, this month, was dedicated to a Roman god called Janus, the god of beginnings. He was a god of doorways, could be called Yanwai, or the god of archways, Jani, and was normally put at the exits or the entrances in order to bless those who go out and come in. Now, you may remember among the Jews, they have a blessing in the Psalms that says, may God bless you as you go out and as you come in. In the book of Deuteronomy, 28 verse 6, they say, may God bless you as you go out and as you come in. Whether it is by parallel invention or cultural diffusion or religious diffusion between the Romans and the Jews, this is a concept that is found between these two ancient communities. And as God, universal God, blesses the people as they go out and as they come in, Janus was the God of the Romans who was blessing them as they were going in and coming back. Normally, the Roman soldiers, as they were going out for war, would ritualistically walk below this statue of Janus the God in order to invite luck. Otherwise, if they walked without respect, fate would be upon them, and it depended on their disposition as they were walking under this statue. The doors of the shrine dedicated to this god Janus were left open in times of war so that the people may run there to get peace from him and they were closed during the times of peace because they needed not to appease him. He was the god of peace and wars and only in times of war could he be appeased. He was invoked as the god of all beginnings and he was regulating all the Roman liturgies. He was invoked at the beginning of the day, at the beginning of the month, at the beginning of the agricultural seasons, and everything had, that had a beginning was sacred and was offered to him. The month of January is named after him, and the feast day of this god was on the 9th of January. He was often represented by a double-faced man one facing in front, another one facing behind, in that he could see the past and could see the future. 
in that being at the beginning of the year, he was able to look at what you have done throughout the year and what you intend to do in the coming year. Some shrines would have him having four faces, one facing to the north, the other one to the south, other one facing to the east, and another one facing to the west. And this is the only God in the, um, in the family of gods among the Romans. He is the only God who was not borrowed from other communities. Almost all the Roman gods were borrowed from the Greeks, from the Egyptians, and others, and they shared some similarity. But this was called the unique God. He was considered the first among all gods and considered the god of all beginnings and ends. On the first day of January, it was often the day of regret and wasted year and also a day of decision making. There are so many people out there at this moment who are doing things that they will regret tomorrow morning. Either they took an extra cup of wine or they indulged with a friend or a wife that was not his, a husband who was not his, or they did a few things, and at the beginning of the year, they start lamenting. Over the December holidays, especially from Christmas to this time, there are people who have overeaten the money that they need, maybe, especially in Kenya, they are to take their children on Monday to school, and they will start crying that they have not done enough. This was the God of regrets, where people would go to him and tell him, Hey, sir God, we have done that which we ought not to have done, and we are dedicating our losses to you. He was that unique God among the Romans who was not adopted from the Greek pantheon. Janus, as we said, was the Latin word for the door. He is the God that opens for the months that are ahead. He was considered a janitor or the doorkeeper of heaven, and was de depicted in a way that with his head turning backwards and another one turning forwards, it means that nothing was hidden away from him and he was called an all-seeing God. He held a staff with the right hand in order to indicate directions, to direct, to guide, and indicate the correct way to travel us, and with the left hand he would open the gates for them. He was venerated as a god of war and peace. He was venerated as the father of all ages, and he was associated with the calendar from the year 153 BC when 12 altars were built at his shrine. Before then, the calendar used to have 10 months, but now, nine months, and now with the addition of July and August, then Janus, it had 12 months, and with these 12 shrines, Every month became a shrine to be dedicated to these gods now and then. From the year 153 BC onwards, the Roman councils or the chief magistrates of the Republic, they took their vows or their offices on the first day of January, and these new officers offered prayers to Janus the god, and the priests dedicated offerings to this god Janus, including salt and traditional ballet. The Romans would share the New Year gifts, among them gifts like uh, dates, figs, and honey. There were New Year wishes and vows to the friends they who had attended, and they would bring good fortunes and prosperity to the participants. Being the chief of all the deities, of beginnings and the endings, the first and the last, and probably the Alpha and Omega, he received all Roman public sacrifices Incense and incense and wine before other deities. Before you could go to appease all the other deities, you'd begin with Janus, the god of uh, the beginnings. It is because he was the doorkeeper of the heavens, and he pointed the route through which one had to reach to other gods on high. He was thus respected. Offerings would be made to Janus before planting to ensure good crop. In January, we plant the seeds of the year that is to come, and we ask from God through the religious practices and sacrifices, especially the sacrifice of the mass, to plant a seed for the coming year. Janus was a meeting point between eternity and temporality. He linked that which had already expired and that which never had been. Janus, in my estimation, seems to be the figure of Jesus Christ, whose birth into the world we have celebrated this Christmas eight days before. 
Every people have desired some blessings from God, and especially our elder brothers, the Jews. If we read Deuteronomy 28, 6, they say, may God bless you as you go out and as you come in. Having these two faces, one projected to the past and the other one to the future, would reach it its culmination in Jesus, who is called the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end in Revelation 1.8. Being the God of peace and war, to whom things that went wrong were dedicated to be righted up, he meets the, his fulfillment in Jesus, who is the Prince of Peace, yet the sword talked of by Simeon. Linking in linking that which is already gone and that which is already to come would be seen as the fulfillment in Jesus who divides history before his coming and after his coming because with Jesus we have BC and AD. It is with him that history takes shape. So as we talk of Janus, the God of the beginnings, who marked that which was and that which has never been, we look at Jesus Christ who starts in the middle of history the times before his coming and the times after his coming. Now we come to the context of the reading that we have chosen today. I've told you that the readings are so rich that I'm only going to choose that one reading only in Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 to 26. What is the context of this reading? The Israelites have stagnated for a period of around one year around Mount Sinai since they made their covenant with God. They have not been able to move from Mount Sinai and they have been going in circles around there. They have stagnated and they have to make a new beginning from this time onwards. They are now preparing to leave this place and head through the desert to the promised land. They, we, they are not going to have a very easy journey. Remember, they are going through the desert where there is shortage of food, there is shortage of water, and there will be so many communities fighting against them, and there will be a, it will be a place of shortage, purification, and you know, if you have read the Bible, you know how many thousands of people and generations were destroyed there until they get to the promised land. So the journey they are going to make is not a very easy job. And this blessing for them is given as a kind of viaticum. Viaticum is the food for the journey. If you go to the anointing of the sick, there is the Eucharist, and the anointing that is given to them is normally called the food of the journey or the viaticum. And for us, this blessing that is given to these people who are moving out to a journey can be meant or intended to keep them against all wickedness, all odds, all evils until they get to their destiny. We disable them because we are at Mount Sinai, and this is our Mount Sinai. When we had this covenant with God eight days ago, when God entered into the human history, he reminds us of that covenant that made the Israelites a chosen people, and we, the chosen people of God, having Jesus coming in our midst, born like us except by sin, coming into a human flesh, then we have to move from this Sinai, we have to move from Bethlehem, we have to move from this encounter that we had in each of our hearts, and we have to go with him. We have signed a covenant with him, and he has signed a covenant with each one of us, and we are ready to begin our journey to heaven. God asks these blessings of the priest. What the priest? As we begin that reading, we are told, and he told Aaron and his sons, this is how you be blessing the people. Who is a priest? A priest in Latin is called pontifex, and pontifex is a bridge between the visible and the invisible, the heavens and the earth, man and God. The priest will stand before men to listen to them so that he can take their needs and pleas and sacrifices to God. A priest sought forgiveness and blessings from God on behalf of the sinful people who could not approach God when they had offended him. He stood before the people in order to bring to them the feedback from God. The major work of the priest was to offer sacrifices to God and to bless them. In fact, he had almost three duties. One is to intercede for them. The second one is to teach them the will of God, and the third one is to bless them. Now, from the reading that we have read, there are six things. 
that we have had that are going to take the rest of our meditation. Now, the first thing, or maybe we mentioned them by passing, the first one is, may God bless you. The second one is, may God keep you. The third one is, may God make his face shine upon you. The fourth one is, may God be gracious to you. The fifth one, may God lift up his countenance to you. And the sixth one is, may God give you peace. Now, if you look at that formula, it enshrines everything that humanity may look from God and all the providence that God may give to human beings. As we begin the year, looking at these blessings and meditating upon them, they have all the whole mirror that we need to eat for our journey. If we pick it for our viaticum and we are going on a journey, we shall not miss anything and we shall not be tempted to look for help from other gods or from other places apart from God himself. We come to the first one. May God bless you. This is a blessing addressed both to the individuals and, and the community. It is both in the singular and plural. When he says God bless you, it is you within the community or you together. He is giving his blessing both to the individual and the community. And this is reminding us of the place of an individual within the community and the role, role of the community to the individuals. This blessing summarizes the providence of God from all dimensions in what they shall need to transverse through the desert. This blessing summarizes the work of God and his relationship with this community that he has chosen and beyond. The blessings that he is going to give them are integral. That is, they are spiritual blessings, they are economical blessings, they are emotional blessings, they are physical blessings, they are temporal blessings, they are eternal blessings, they are other blessings, they are heavenly blessings, direct blessings, indirect blessings on their health, their well-being, both as individuals and as a community that is coming down to us. His blessings cover both creation, redemption, and the greatest of all that is his eternal presence among us through his incarnation. Remember this feast is being celebrated only eight days after his birth in our Mideast, and the greatest gift he has given to us is Emmanuel, God with us, his unfading presence in our Mideast. This blessing that he is giving us embraces all the gifts of fecundity, prosperity, and the best of all is the blessings unlike all the others without conditions attached to it. When he is giving these blessings, it's different from the commandments because he says, I shall be your God if you do this. I will bless you if you are obedient. But the blessings that he is giving us at the beginning of the year are without any condition, no matter our state of disobedience, of sins, of whatever situation we are in, God promises to bless us. This act of blessing reminds us the power of words. Through our words, we too can become agents of God's blessings to his people. We need to think about the words that we give out every day. What do we tell our young sisters, our young brothers? If they are the parents, sometimes they say, when the child grows up, he will be tempted or she will be tempted to know what a thief looks like. Or if you tell that child, this child may might be tempted to go and look for a bangi to smoke so that he can see the kind of eyes that the mother is wishing of him or her. So what words do I give? With this blessing, we ask, do the words that I give out edify my neighbor? aid my salvation and lead to the glory of God. With this blessing, we seek for the fulfillment of God's providence and the promises in the coming year and beyond. When we depend upon his blessings, we shall be stable and we shall not fall. To bless in, in, in uh, Hebrew literally means to kneel down in readiness to serve. The word blessing in Hebrew has the equivalent of kneeling in the position to serve. And maybe this is the action that Jesus does on the night of Passover. We are told he bent, removed the outer garment in order to serve them. Meaning that when we are blessed by God, we are put in a position to serve one another and to serve him. The second blessing. 
May the Lord keep you. What does it mean to be kept by God? Here, it means to offer protection, to offer security, to grant shelter integrally. God promises to protect his people from evil and all its consequences, especially as they walk through the desert in their journey of exodus. He promises to provide for their needs and to keep them from falling when they are weak. It gives an image of erecting a wall around them to keep them from all sorts of harm. Remember these people are walking through the desert without houses. They are not assured of any meal. They are not assured of food. They are not assured of water. They do not have the right weapons to fight against their community. So when he is telling them that the Lord will keep you, it means that he will be their security, he will be their protection, he will provide their shelter, and it is reassuring that God will protect them and give them support. It means that the Lord is ready to offer them all that they will need along their way so that they may not be tempted to look for sustenance from the idols or help from other sources, including the communities around them. It means that when we are going through this year, as the Lord promises to bless us and keep us, he is telling us that he has sufficient for us that we need every day, every week, every month, every year and throughout our lives, that we are not supposed to go looking for it elsewhere but from him, in that all the sources of our wealth and for our sustenance must lead to the glory of God. In order to keep them, he will prolong his presence among them, and this is what he has done through this Christmas event by becoming God among us all, Emmanuel. The third blessing. May God make his face shine upon you. This is anthropomorphism, giving God human qualities. In 2008, when I was a novice here, we were given a recollection by Sister Nicole, who is here, and she requested us to meditate on the human face. I remember we, in, the, in this community, we are two who did our novitiate here, and we were with Sister Josephine there. And Sister requested of us to look at each other for five minutes, then you write everything that you see on the face of the other. And then she told us, look at how shameful it could be the retro that you know of the other face. Then she told us of the characteristics of the face that I'll tell you some other day, not today. But this face of God, anthropomorphism, which means giving God human qualities, indicates that shining face of God carrying with it the benevolence of God. God is seen to be smiling to them. And when he looks down at us while smiling, it means that he gives us hope and revival. His light and brightness and brilliance that is celestial will cast out all doubts. This face, when he looks at us in Psalms 104, we are told that he recreates and he renews the earth. But when he turns away, everything fades away and dies. This face will drive away despair. This face summarizes the whole person. Now, this is part of what I stole from that recollection from Sister Nicole. We are told that the face summarizes the... You know, when a person meets you and you have been talking about him or her, he tells you, go away. Or you don't want to see that face. And I remember Sister asking us, why is it that when a person is condemned for murder or something, the face will be covered before he is injected the poison or shot? Or when you meet... In a camera, you are doing something funny and you see somebody who knows you, you cover your, your, your face with something. Or maybe when you come to the courtroom and you have done something that is not worthy, your status, you try to cover the face or turn away. Or you have been speaking about me and I come. Then you start drinking water, you cannot swallow it, you turn the face. The sister, I'm remind, remembering what you told us those years, 12 years ago. And this is the face of God that has been meditated upon in the psalm and this first, first reading that... When this face is given to us, it recreates us, it renews us, it makes us, it gives us a new beginning. When this face of God is shining to us, it brings about joy, peace, and impeding blessings that help us in growing towards our self-awareness. This shining face of God gives us approval. When it is drooping face, it is symbolic of disapproval, and that God is not with us. But because he is smiling at us, then he will walk with us. 
When this face shines upon us, he removes from us all tribulations and assures us his hope. The fourth, fourth blessing. May God be gracious to you. Grace means undeserved gift. It may also mean uncomparable beauty. Only God can bless and he does so unconditionally. You don't have to do something on your part for God to bless you. You do not merit it. You don't have to buy his blessings. You cannot bribe him. By being gracious, he meets our needs without our merit. In his graciousness, he opens his hand and feeds everything that is living. His graciousness towards us improves our conditions, our living standards, our esteem. His graciousness invites us to be graceful to others too. When we have met with people, we do not do we improve their esteem or we leave them broken because of how disgraceful we treated them? How do we relate with the people? After having been blessed with this graciousness and we are going into the new year, shall you be an object of being graceful to the people or disgraceful to them? Embracing God's graciousness would mean taking up responsibilities and allowing the back to stop at a certain point that is not passing it on. It invites us to re-examine re our interpersonal relationships of our relationship with God and um, the relationship with others. In case they are not okay, we need to ask for help from him to modify them. In this graciousness, God is promising to make us prosper. The fifth blessing, may God lift up his countenance upon you. May God show self-control over you. In the psalm we have heard that the God is slow to anger. God is not, uh, oh God, gracious and bless us. Let your face shed it light right upon us. So we'll be known on the earth. Uh, the, the nations shout for joy. This kind of graciousness that God is presented to have is a graciousness that has no room for anger and punishment. Quite often, we de describe God as one always with a whip to punish us, who is hostile to us. But at the beginning of the year, we are given the image of God who is gracious and who has countenance, and he may be, uh, he says that with this blessing, God will be slow to anger and will show compassion over us. He will blot all our offenses and no longer remember them. It is wishing that his temperance be over us, that even when we ought to be punished, we may, he may not let his vengeance pass with, on us to destroy us. It is a blessing that intends the, in, the, tender, the tenderness of God to be up, upon us in an integral way so that we can come out of his hands and wounded. It says, may you feel secure to return to him when you have offended in order to receive healing from you because he's not going to punish you. May his concern over you be, go uninterrupted even when you have abandoned him. That countenance of God means that may he find you where you are broken and made you. May he be tethered to you when he is correcting you after offending him. After receiving his countenance, may you also show self-control to others. May you have moderation in your relationship with others and things. May you show self-restraint when you are offended by others. May you treat others as a gentleman, as a gentlewoman, in gentleness to all those who come along your way. The sixth blessing. May God give you peace. Peace is a very broad Term. Some days ago, I was meditating on my Facebook page on the word Shalom, and it has almost 50 meanings. I am not pretending to give you all these 50 meanings tonight. When God is blessing his people with peace, and the equivalent of the word peace in Greek is Irene, the equivalent of it in Hebrew is Shalom. Now, this peace would mean integral well-being in terms of prosperity, in terms of security, in terms of integrity of life, in terms of happiness of the family, safety, good wealth, 
health and friendship. Peace is the other name for God in Judges chapter 6, verses 24. Peace is a self-donation of God, and the Christmas event that we have just celebrated eight days ago, we have received Jesus, the Prince of Peace, who is the Son of God. It may mean the wholeness of life, the body, the mind, the soul, the spirit. It also may mean the absence of fear, serenity, tranquility, perfection, completeness, safety, rest, rest, harmony of life, absence of strife, absence of agitation, triumph after war, end of pandemic, like now if we pray that God ends corona for us and it ends, we shall say shalom, we shall say peace, absence of discord, that interior integration after in, an integral restoration of healing. This peace may be understood from a covenantal dimension in the relationship between God and his people. It may mean a restoration of a once broken relationship. We have just had the angels singing Grow, Gloria, glory to God in the highest and peace on earth to people of goodwill. So the peace that is brought by the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem and in the hearts of each one of us is what the Lord is wishing of each one of us in this first reading. By God declaring peace to his people, he intends of them progress, success, prosperity, fulfillment that arises from integral development of the community together and to each individual within that community. When God blesses his people with peace, he indicates that both interior and exterior conflict is surmounted. This blessing of peace may indicate a radical reconciliation of warring parties. This is an assurance that the catastrophes ahead of us in the coming year, shall be, we shall be victorious with him. Peace may mean that all debts have been paid for us in a single installment. Peace may indicate a new beginning where the past is blotted out and there comes new things as though nothing existed before. God wishes fecundity and fruitfulness to them. Though they go through the desert which is sterile, he will make them fruitful. After their stagnation around Mount Sinai, they are now good to go with these six-fold blessings. We cannot live at peace with ourselves and with God and with we cannot live at peace with ourselves if we are not at peace with God and with others and nature. This is what he has assured us through these blessings. When we examine closely at these blessings, we realize that it is a cultic blessing that is offered within the context of a ritual sacrifice. It has the overtones of the sin offering that is offered when man is separated from God in sin. When we deal with our sinfulness, we go to, to the priest and he offers that blessing that is symbolized by the words, may God bless you and keep you safe. This is a formula that the priest uses after receiving and offering the sin offering on behalf of the people. Then next, the next step is the consecration of these people and their lives to God. This was represented by a burnt offering, symbolized by the blessings. When the priest has received the burnt offering and done it on behalf of the people, he would say, may the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Then there was peace offering that was offered when a real fellowship between God and men was attained. Once the, the, sin, uh, the sin is forgiven, you are reconciled with God and peace is restored, then you sit at the table to eat with God and this is when you offer peace offering and the blessing is given with the words, may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. What is, this, what is the purpose of these blessings that we are receiving at the beginning of this year? God is blessing, God's blessings will make his people rich in spirit. When we have received these blessings that we are getting from God, he is going to bless us in a very intimate way 
and he gives his blessings that he has power to fulfill. The second thing, his blessings will assure the people of his protection from all or from his all-powerfulness. He promises to keep us. The third thing, God's blessings will bring with them towards us the light for our paths. Though we may have sinned, he does not frown against us, but he smiles to us in order to give us hope. He promises to have his face shine upon us. The fourth purpose of this blessing. In his blessings, he absorbs us into his kindness and tenderness, even when we do not deserve his favors, and his graciousness is sufficient. The fifth thing. He grants us through his blessings integral peace. He crowns us with all the blessings.